You're watching India Sense. I'm Gauri Dwedi. Let's get the headlines this Friday evening. First up, India, Maldives, Sri Lanka hold NSA level talks in Colombo security conclave as China and India flex muscles in pole bound Sri Lanka as both dock warships in Colombo on the same day. India China power play intensifying in Bangladesh as well. Strong message coming in from External Affairs Minister to Pakistan that New Delhi will engage with Islamabad as per its own strategic interests. Let me say this. I think the era of uninterrupted dialogue with Pakistan is over. Actions have Mohammad Yunus's interim government fails to give any timeline for holding elections in Bangladesh, lifts the Hasina era ban on radical Jamaat e Islami, frees radical elements like Jashimuddin Rahmani, imposes travel ban on 14 ministers of the Hasina government. The case count on former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina crosses 100. Four months after his party won a brute majority in Parliament, Maldivian President Mohammad Muizu claims the opposition is destabilizing his government. Maldivian economy grappling with an alarming drop in foreign reserves. Will the pro-China Maldivian president use this as an excuse to seek more Chinese funds? And the French flip-flop over the next Prime Minister continues as President Macron rejects the sixth Prime Ministerial candidate in the last seven weeks since the results through a hung parliament. The big story on India Sense. India is now playing the power game with China in its neighbourhoods. It's upping the ante in vital strategic locations like Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, whether it's geopolitics, geoeconomics, as well as military positioning and posturing. Both Colombo and Dhaka are important countries that have swung in favour of China in the past, lured by the large and limitless Chinese checks and driven by political dispensations that became anti-India. Now, both these nations are in the midst of a political and economic flux. They sit on vital sea links and trade routes and are located in India's backyard its traditional area of influence, where China is trying to gain a larger footprint. These are also countries that have witnessed regime changes in the last few years due to people's movements, adding to the uncertainty that they are both susceptible to, requiring New Delhi to play the power competition game that it's now playing with Beijing. Sri Lanka will hold its first election since its last president, Gotabaya Rajapaksha, was driven out. The posturing by New Delhi to dock its warship with China, along with China, is testimony to its commitment to not let Beijing make another inroad for another port like Hambantota, a key asset that's now owned by Chinese companies and sits on important sea links. India does not need to project power in distant shores, but on crucial sea links that impact its trade and strategic interests, New Delhi is now flexing its muscles. Take a look at Bangladesh now, which needs India to fund the transition to normalcy for its economic stability and long-term growth. The Bangladesh economy has been ravaged by an economic slump as well as dwindling trade due to the turmoil as now added to the inflation and economic woes. India needs to fund some of the $8 billion that Bangladesh needs, whether it's in the form of concessional loans or infra financing. That remains to be seen. But in a post Hasina Bangladesh, India needs to deepen its leverage and play the great power game. Mohammad Yunus has also released radical elements like Jashimuddin Rahmani, and New Delhi has to ensure that Bangladesh does not go the way of Pakistan, where its dysfunctional politics, along with a broken economy and growing influence of radical elements, has led to that unending cycle of violence, all of which targets India, which is why it's crucial for New Delhi to keep up the ante.
Shifting focus now to the first wide-angle story on the show, the deadly attack in Pakistan's Balochistan region, where Punjabis were attacked and targeted, has a very strong message for China. It raises questions about the longevity of the China-Pakistan equation, as well as the CPEC. Now, Pakistan and China are not natural partners. They've come together because they want to create security challenges for India. They mutually hate India. But this convenient relationship has it run its course. Continued terror attacks in Balochistan has cast doubts about the future of CPEC or the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, integral to Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative. And it's now its most uncertain part. CPEC has not alleviated the genuine concerns of the Balochis, who feel that the projects are exclusionary, they're exploitative, and they're centralized in their planning and pretty much help the Punjabis at the expense of Balochis. And this is the reason why Baloch insurgents target Punjabis again and again. The Gwadar port, which is the Chinese-managed deep water port in Balochistan, is now a constant source of tension between Pakistan and China and is at the receiving end of a multiple attacks. China has dialed back because of that on its future investments in Pakistan. CPEC 2.0 is off the table. No new projects are being green-singled by Beijing anymore. Even the PM-level trips by Pakistan is not making China change its mind. And will these fresh attacks ensure that China dials back further? Or will it just now cut back its losses and exit Balochistan? The numbers seem to suggest that. China has invested $25 billion against the much-hyped figure of $62 billion seven years back when the CPEC was in its full steam. Recently, the Chinese envoy to Pakistan also said that China is there to help Pakistan, but it will do only so much. He quoted Mao Zedong, saying that success requires you to stand on your feet, indicating that Pakistan's inability to protect Chinese nationals and Chinese assets makes any more support untenable. China's goal is not to set up security posts and wait for the next attack. Instead, it will now just cut back, impacting Pakistan and its finances, vindicating India, which has stayed away from BRI all along. Shifting focus now to the second wide-angle story, where uh, it's about Maldives, where it's just been four months since the Maldivian president, Mohamed Muizu's party, won a supermajority in parliament. The party seems to now be coming to an end for Mohamed Muizu, despite having an unprecedented executive power and a huge parliamentary backing to reshape Maldives' policies, Mohamed Muizu has claimed that his government could be toppled and it could be a financial coup that could be happening in Maldives. Muizu has steered Mali away from India towards China and in the process, Green signaled a plethora of financially unviable projects, leaving the small nation's finances in complete tatters. Add to it the financial impact of Indians now rejecting Maldives as a big tourist destination, impacting the foreign exchange reserves that the country has. Take a look at this report that tells you just how those finances of Maldive government have unraveled in the last 15 days. Behind these breathtaking white beaches lie the ugly truth about the Maldivian economy. And the precarious state of government finances under President Mohamed Muizu. On 21st of August, Maldives ran out of usable dollar reserves. An alarming situation that meant the small island country could not pay for any international purchases like an outstanding $25 million crude oil payment. This led to the regulator Maldives Monetary Authority writing to the finance minister. To arrest the flight of dollars from the economy, on 25th of August, the Bank of Maldives blocked dollar transactions on rufia cards and slashed the limit of the previously issued cards to just $100. Shockingly, within hours these measures were reversed at the instruction of the regulator and possibly at the behest of the president. This flip-flop over an unprecedented crisis shows the inability to address a possible insolvency of the Maldivian government. 
even as President Moizu claimed BML's measures were taken to instigate political unrest and overthrow his popular government. The financial situation in Maldives remains dire, with a run on the currency and a sovereign downgrade remaining as a real possibility. Compounding Moizu's troubles is the fact that he needs to come up with funds to repay the large Chinese loans. So why is this important to India? Well, Maldives sits where 50% of India's external trade and 80% of its energy imports pass through those shipping lines. So a bankrupt or a financially unstable Maldives will allow Mohammed Moizu to give further leeway to China, both by offering strategic national assets like ports and also with a direct military presence, possibly a big base like Djibouti. India will not just have to be vigilant, but will also have to respond to a potential economic crisis. Despite Muizu's India Out campaign, India cannot stay out of Mali. In fact, talk more about... Talking more about Maldives, uh, we have with us the first top voice uh, on the show. We have Ahmed Adib, who is the former vice president of Maldives, joining me on the broadcast. Sir, thank you so much for taking out the time. Speaking to NDTV, my question to you, sir, how do you read the statements that were made by uh, Mohammed Muizu when he said that a financial coup is what he thinks opposition is up to? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I've been on NDTV um, even in January, um, just a um, few months after uh, President Moise has taken out. Okay. At that time, it was uh, there was a movement called India Out. And that's where, even at that time, I mentioned that um, Maldives needs India, and there'll be a time, there will be a financial crisis uh, because the number showed that the successive governments has taken a lot of deficit finance, which President Moise has inherited. And also he inherited a, a campaign called India Out. But after the parliament elections, as I predicted, everything became the, the relations between Maldives and India has improved. Uh, Ex Minister of External Affairs has just visited Maldives. So, as I concluded, even at that time, uh, Maldives needed India, and it was India was being very lenient even in uh, last April, and also in this September, there are bonds like fifty million dollars bonds, which has been now delayed uh, and given uh, the leniency by India to Maldives. So I would like to say, first of all. Um, if India didn't uh, given the leniency, this would have happened more earlier. But it was uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, gracefulness, and as well as uh, uh, India has been always there for Maldives, as I have been repeatedly saying that. So what we see today is uh, the successive deficit financing of Maldives. Uh, Maldives tourism sector is doing very well. Uh, we have built a world's luxury resort to its destination. I've been part of it. And, and but I would say that uh, living beyond our means with a big uh, welfare programs uh, that is not sustainable. Okay. We, this is the result what, what we see today. But but is there a financial is there a financial coup that's taking place in Maldives? I believe that uh, uh, I will um, comment on the coup because there's a political side of it. But I would say there is a, a problem. There is a problem. There is a crisis, which I, I wouldn't blame President Muiz because he's just been seven months into the presidency. It's something he inherited. So it's time to recognize there is a problem. There is an issue out of it. So if there's any, in any crisis, uh, there is opposition, everyone will try to work only against each other. But I would say we should recognize the need. Uh, we should uh, recognize the Fitch ratings, um, the advice of the economists. I would say we should work more together with India, come up with a solution, recognize it, 
so that uh, it's time for the stability. There is no future uh, by using this as a political tool, even by the opposition, because this is something that, that is going to affect every single Maldivian. So I believe there's okay. a crisis, then a coup. Okay, it's a, it's a crisis and not a coup. Thanks so much for uh, speaking to NDTV on uh, what is happening in Maldives. And on that note, we slip into a quick break. We come back on the other side with lots more stick with us. Welcome back. You're watching India Ascent. So with me, Gauri Divedi. It's time for the second top voice on the show, Harshpati Singhania, who's the first vice chair of the International Chamber of Commerce. I spoke with Mr. Singhania on the role of India in steering global businesses at a time when U.S. election is adding to uncertainties. And what would be India's role in leading developing countries towards sustainable economic solutions? Listen in. On the one hand, you are seeing a situation where we are finding uh, global trade or uh, a globalized environment as we had envisaged earlier uh, to be becoming increasingly difficult. But you are also seeing um, a, an increase in regional cooperation because at the end of the day, business has to grow, business and trade. And we have seen that trade, global trade has brought millions of people out of poverty, particularly in developing countries. So global trade is beneficial for all. The challenge is how are we going to achieve it? And this is a challenge for business as well as for government and policymakers. So that is really a scenario which, which we put in front of us. And I think ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce Paris, <clears throat> main, one of his main jobs is to facilitate global trade. So we work on areas of how we can get trade finance. How do we bring in supply chains? How do we include SMEs, which are really the ones which have, we generate large number of jobs. How do we include them in the, in the entire sort supply, of chain. supply chain in the entire equation? And today you have other factors as well. And maybe I'm jumping ahead of what you might have thought in terms of this, but today issues like climate change, issues like digitalization, all of them are mixed up in this. Absolutely. And before we get to some of those, uh, speaking on trade, uh, you know, there is an election happening in the US and Donald Trump, it looks like a, you know, a race that could go down to the wire. And if Donald Trump does come as the next president of US, how do you think it would impact trade, trade ties, and in terms of the whole tariff equation? And how do you see ICC being and, and the role it may play in terms of ensuring that these trade tensions do not overtake a bilateral relationship. See, this will be challenging. Let's not um, kid ourselves. But at the same time, I think every country realizes the benefits they can get from lower cost sourcing. So while countries want to, rightly so, look at their own domestic issues and domestic job creation, etc. They also have consumers and the same people who benefit from more efficient production that could happen somewhere else. And hence the issue of trade across borders. Now, ICC works very closely with the WTO. And ICC has special groups with the WTO, where we try and see solutions that will be in the interest uh, of different nations. I understand that it may not just be a bilateral relationship that ICC would focus on, but the fact that U.S. may come out with more tra uh, trade tariffs is not a problem that will be unique to India if, yes. if Donald Trump comes to power. So how does that become then a bigger challenge, not just for India, but for some of the other countries as well, developing countries? And how do you envisage uh, you know, any such mechanisms to be in place to ensure uh, that they are tackled and don't uh, become a larger uh, geopolitical issue. See, ICC will use its um, position and efforts to advocate with different policymakers and governments. So while I mentioned the WTO being a larger sort of multilateral organization, but bilaterally also with governments and policymakers or with trade blocs, uh, ICC works with them 
to talk to them as to what would be a, uh, a sort of a reasonable level of tariffs which balances local issues along with benefits that come from global trade. You mentioned climate, you mentioned sustainability as uh, a key area. Uh, how do you see that shaping uh, business discussions going forward? How do you see organizations and associations like ICC sort of shaping uh, a larger conversation around climate change going forward? It's a very important question. Uh, today, it's not about just moving goods across from one country to another. It's about how sustainability, uh, how sustainably they have been produced and how are they going to be accepted by a customer. Because today, customers are making choices. ICC tries to bring in, uh, we have a climate action change policy. We are working with various groups. ICC is a part of all the COP discussions. Yes. Um, and, and so ICC tries to put together uh, policies or advocates for policies which are going to be fair and progressive and what we would call a just transition of, of energy. Inside story segment of the show where we talk about the French politics. It's been seven weeks that the French did not get any coalition a majority. But that cannot be a reason for President Macron to not appoint a prime minister. Take a look at this report to know how the entire French political system is now in limbo only because Macron keeps rejecting candidate after candidate. Take a look. Seven weeks and six prime ministerial candidates later, France remains in a logjam. An unprecedented political deadlock that has ensured Europe's second largest economy remains without an administrative head since 7th of July when the elections to appoint the prime minister were held. The latest candidate to be rejected by Macron is left-wing new popular front candidate Lucie Castet. The little-known civil servant joins what is now turning out to be a long list of unsuccessful candidates. Before Castet, Macron had rejected Olivier Fauvé and Marine Trondelier of leftist NFP, Gérald Darmanin and François Bayrou of the centre-right ensemble, and Xavier Bertrand from the right-wing Les Républicains. All because he wants a prime minister who will only follow his agenda. But that's a problem. Because of the fractured French mandate, which has not given any party a majority, allowing Macron to continue the political crisis. Leftist leaders blame President Macron for his personal role in the political turmoil, with some even calling for him to be impeached. Macron has angered his opponents by delaying political talks for the duration of the Paris Olympic Games, calling it an Olympic truce. Macron's delay in appointing the prime minister is because there is no rule requiring the president to confirm a candidate from the party that won the most seats, nor a specific timeline for the decision. Both liberals and right-wing factions have vowed to block an NFP-led government. Macron has insisted that any prime minister candidate must enjoy cross-party support, raising questions about the purpose of elections in the first place. With only a few weeks remaining before the 2025 draft budget is due to be read in parliament, France is threatened by an unprecedented political situation. And as things stand, the president is showing no urgency to address it. With that is a wrap on this edition of India Sense with me, Gauri Dvedi. Thanks so much for watching.